director of Insight. I've been pra practicing PV, participatory video, for 10 years now. Started off working mainly with young people. And uh, I'm a self trained filmmaker, first of all, which I think is really important. My name's Chris Lunch, and uh, I got into participatory video really through uh, my backgrounds. I was trained in anthropology and um, I was involved in a research project in Kazakhstan working with shepherds as a social researcher using quite traditional methods, quite extractive. I felt very unha unhappy and uncomfortable with the method of research where we were going in, spending a lot of time with the shepherds, asking them quite personal questions, writing it all down. Then my role was to write a big report and I, I wondered who actually would read that report and how it would actually impact on any policy makers. And at the same time, I, of course, I knew about Nick's work in England with kids. And I thought, well, surely this method could be applied to what I'm doing, rather than having an outsider analysing and recording and presenting. Why not get them to do that, get them to analyse the situation, to tell what they know, to communicate directly to the policymakers. And I saw myself as a, a bridge, really. There's still a real need for this kind of work, for, for communities to be given a voice and to be included in the, in the kind of debates and in the research that's going on and to, to be given space in that whole development arena to hear their voice and hear their perspectives and hear their ideas because actually we know it's really the people who are in that situation who know best how to improve their situation or change their situation. It's, um, that's, that's, that's one half of it. The other half of it is is that the actual process itself is so exciting and that's the bit that I'm, I've always got most into really. Just seeing how participatory video, how the, the act of learning uh, learning to make a film and doing that collectively yeah. transforms people. I've seen it so many times. Well, participatory video really turns on its head the traditional role of, of the filmmaker as the, as the one who decides what he films, where he films, and is in control, really. It turns all that on its head. It's the subjects who become the ones in control, um, and it, it puts the camera in their hands. So I think that's the crucial difference, and that changes everything, really. Again, it's you know down to process, um, <clears throat> process really coming before product. I guess is, is another difference. As a, as a filmmaker, documentary filmmaker, you're I think always thinking of the product, the final product, the final audience, and how you're going to tie this scene with this scene. And, and so it's a lot of manipulation uh, involved, wh whether you like it or not. Whereas with participatory video, you're really trying to go in there without an agenda ideally. It's about giving voice to as many people, many different parts of the community. It's, um, it's specifically, in my view, participatory, partic participatory videos, specifically about amplify amplifying the voices of, uh, of, of the poor, of the disadvantaged, the marginalised, people who don't get to speak, who don't have a voice. Um, it's very much a political process, and that's the way I've always seen it. It starts with a, a series of games. That this is the way we facilitate participatory video projects. A series of very simple games to teach the, hand, the basic uh, skills needed to make, to make a film, to, to use a camera, but very much keeping away from the technical stuff. Just building confidence. and Building confidence in handling the equipment, uh, filming each demystifying other. Demystifying it as well. It's, it's very much, you know, they are the first ones to take it out of the, out of the case. Yeah. And from that moment on, they are in control. And it's very obvious to them through the games and the way we, we work that this is the way we want to do it, that they're going to be in control. And so in a way, the, some of these games that we use are like metaphors, really, for the wider way that we want to work, where they the ethos, are... Yeah, the, the ethos behind it. Once people have used the camera to film something, we always play it back so they can see what they've filmed. That is the mirror in that they're being able to see themselves in new light and listen to each other in a way that often you don't in a day-to-day -day setting. And so there's that level of, uh, 
that, that's going on. They're building confidence, they're listening, they're, they're analysing, but they're also building technical skills. They're saying, oh, that, that didn't sound very good because we didn't have the microphone very close. Let's next time do that better. As a facilitator, you don't even need to say these things. They, just by watching it back, they're able to note, note it themselves and discuss it themselves and realise. Process, PB process has got a magical quality to it somehow that um, it does uh, unleash something within most individuals um, a sense of just tasting power and tasting that how through looking at through changing perspective um, the a community can actually start to improve its, 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 its quality of life. I find in most communities across the world, I, it seems to be more productive to work with men and women separately. The men are more keen to see what's going on. The women are perhaps more, a little bit shyer at first. Um, but very soon, in many cases, the, the women's group really take off with it and, and start applying the tools in a very creative way and trying out lots of different things and really giving their time to it. Um, the men would be also, but I find often I think it, maybe the, the empowerment is, is, is maybe all the more strong for the women. They, they feel they're doing something new and learning something fresh and it's giving them new possibilities because often they're able to interview men or enter <coughs> contexts that perhaps normally they wouldn't be able to enter. Uh, the camera does, does somehow allow them to transgress some of these boundaries in a non-threatening way. Pretty much everyone in the world is aware of what's, you know, has, has, an, has an inkling of what's going on now in the, in the wider world and how things, and are directly feeling the, the impacts of globalisation in their communities. Um, that's certainly what I've experienced and I've, I've worked in very, very remote areas and it's shocking how much globalisation is, is reaching out now and, and affecting the world. Um, and very, very quickly, things are changing very fast. I think people do want to have a stake in in, in the new world that's emerging. They want, to, uh, they, they want to make sure that they're not at the bottom of the pile as they have been for, for, you know, for generations and generations. And I think this type of new media can help to, to, to build bridges and put people in contact uh, in ways that they never, pos never would have been possible before. Doing this, we're doing this interview um, whilst running a training, a uh, five-day training introduction into participatory video uh, here in Oxford in the community centre. And there's a lot of noise going on behind us because the, the group are um, taking some time out to watch some videos, um, some of our insights work, uh, just as a way of sparking discussion on, on the sort of, uh, ethics of, of PV, the ethos behind it, and, and some of the possible obstacles to um, setting up and running uh, PV projects in, sort of in, in, in real life. And we also happen to have a group doing dancing or yeah, I think there's a like drumming or, dancing or some kind of odd, uh, <laughs> upstairs. There's people things. ringing the bell, coming in and out. <laughs> it's a busy so thanks, Oxford community centre. Thanks for bearing with us. <laughs> yeah.